blue button which matches her hair. <laughs> Amen. We are going to enter into God's word. We're going to preach with the help of the Lord. And uh, we're grateful today for God's goodness, aren't you? Amen. We're going to turn and focus on the book of Acts chapter 9. And we're going to read verses 13 through 18. And we are going to see some exciting things in the Word of God. How many love God's Word? Amen. 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 Can't live without it. It's my daily bread. And we're grateful for God's Word. Acts chapter 9, verse 13 through 18. There was a man by the name of Saul. And he was a Pharisee. And he hated the Christians. This is what the scripture said. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. There's always going to be an enemy of those who call on the name of Jesus. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And so Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight, and then he rose and was baptized. Amen. I want to preach today on this subject, unexpected Christians, unexpected Christians. I said earlier that Saul, even though he was sincere, and even though he was a very religious man, he knew and had to memorize the first five books of the Bible and in order to be a Pharisee. There was no doubt that he loved religion, and he loved the fact that he was a Pharisee. He was a teacher of the law. But when he heard about this Jesus fellow, and he saw that all of these people were following and praising the name of Jesus, something in him rose up and said, I've got to stop these people from worshiping and following Jesus. Now, those of you who follow Jesus think that's absurd. Those of you who know Jesus think that's absurd. But Saul didn't have a Bible. Most of the Bible had not been codified or written yet. And he thought that Jesus was some type of a rebel. He thought that Jesus was maybe a good man, but he was not the Messiah. And all of these people were following him. And Saul had so much uh, anxiety about this that he hated the church and the message that the church preached. And he was bound and determined to destroy it. And I ask the question of you today, would, if you were alive during those times, would you share the good news about Jesus with a man like Saul? Would you go pray for Saul? We're living in a generation right now that is full of Saul's. Amen, that's right. Saul was the most unlikely Christian that anybody Nobody probably thought that Saul would ever be a follower of Jesus Christ. We are looking on our news today and we are seeing people that are angry and hate-filled and shaking their fists and tearing down monuments and setting things on fire. And we think in our heart, I'll witness to this person, but I sure won't witness to them because they're the most unlikely Christian that hate-filled person, that person that's screaming obscenities and 
raising signs and tearing down statues. And it doesn't stop there. Some of you, you have friends that, that you won't witness to them. You won't pray for them because you think that that's, it's not very likely that they could become a Christian. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He didn't put parameters on who could get saved or who was most likely to get saved. Uh, God didn't come, Jesus didn't come to this earth and say, well, I'll save those, but I can't save those. No, Jesus picked the most unlikely person and he can save them from a world of sin. And that there may be people even in this room that you think, I've tried, I've prayed, I've done everything I can do, but they won't budge. They won't change. You might have children in your own home that you have tried and prayed and cried and fasted for them. And it seems so unlikely that they will ever give their heart to the Lord or that they would come back to the Lord. You may be living with a spouse that it seems like they would never, ever give their heart to God. But if you look at this man by the name of Saul, who later became Paul, he did, after God got a hold of him and knocked him off of his horse on the way to Damascus and showed him who he really was, he was one of the greatest Christians that ever could have stepped on planet Earth. Yep. And yet he was so unlikely. Yeah. That neighbor of yours that smokes pot and cusses like a sailor. I've got a few of those. <laughs> that neighbor that has all the bumper stickers that are anti-God. Don't talk to me about organized religion. they got every reason in the world why Jesus is wrong and the church is wrong. Listen, God came for them. Amen. Amen. God came for them. Because you look in the Bible at who Jesus looked for when he began his ministry. Did he go to the people wearing robes and, and did he go to the people with all the religion? No. He had a deep problem with them. The first place he went was to the lost sheep of Israel. You know who the lost sheep of Israel were? They were the ones that they were raised as Jews. They knew all the Jewish laws, but they were so disenchanted with the religion of Jewish being a Jew that they wandered away and didn't even practice it. You know why we have empty seats in life church today? If we could bring back all the people who have wandered away, this house would be full and you'd be begging for folding chairs. Right. There's a lot of lost sheep that used to come to Sunday school, used to shout down the aisles, used to be full of the Holy Spirit, but where are they now? They're lost in bitterness. They're lost in frustration. They're lost in disillusionment because there's a devil out there who lures them away, and he says, he says it's not what they say it is, and, and all the things they tell you about Jesus, they're not true. You see, the devil's doing his job Every day, 24-7, luring people away from the truth that will save their soul. The lost sheep of Israel. That's who Jesus came to. That's why he would have dinner with, with uh, people who drank. He would have socialized with the publicans and the sinners. How long has it been since you invited a sinner out to eat? How long has it been since you picked somebody who was held down in a heathen and you made up your mind I'm going to pray for that person I'm going to fast for that person Jesus didn't come looking for religious folks no he come for the lost sheep of Israel Amen. and all of you know and you probably have people in your family and you probably are thinking right now of people that are lost in their sin lost in the idea that the church has let them down that that uh, there's nothing God has for them. But I'm here to tell you, every one of us sometime in our life was a lost sheep. Amen. That's right. Every person in this place at some point, you were an unlikely Christian. Right. Oh, I'll tell you, I, I know the testimony of many of you in this place. And, and some of you, if I would have been around you back in your heyday in the world of sin, I probably would have said, and they're probably an unlikely Christian. 
You see, we're good about categorizing people, but Jesus sees past the tattoos. Jesus sees past the drug addiction, the alcohol addiction. Jesus sees past the mistakes. He sees past, and what he sees is a person who is lost, yep. lost, hopelessly lost. Right. Amen. Jesus looked for those who were once worshipers, who were once part of the sheepfold, but now they've wandered away from God. I'm telling you, the devil, he does everything he can to attack a believer's mind and to keep you away from the house of God, keep you away from his word, keep you frustrated, keep you arguing over trivial things that don't even matter. He'll use any trick he can to make you a lost sheep. And then Jesus came to those who were spiritually sick. Spiritually sick. Luke chapter 5, verses 30 and 32. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. When Jesus showed up on planet Earth, his goal was not to get the church big and have a lot of money because they'd already done that. No, he was looking for the people who were bruised, the, the people who were, their fire was about to go out. He was looking for the people who were weary and tired and tired of being addicted, tired of being troubled in their mind. That's who Jesus came for. Matthew chapter 12, verses 18 through 21. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will pour my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Jesus didn't just come for the Jews. He came for the Gentiles as well. Amen. And then he will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering whip he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. I'm telling you today that there's a name above every other name. It's a name above Trump. It's a name above world leaders and popes. It's a name above all. The name of Jesus Christ is a name you can trust in and believe in because there's power in the name of Jesus. There's authority in the name of Jesus. I know what it's like to be laying on my bed at night and looking up into the darkness of the room and have a sense of hopelessness in my mind. But when I speak the name Jesus, the atmosphere changes because that name Amen. has authority and power Amen. over every evil that this world is full of. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Jesus came for the bruised reed. He came for the smoldering wick. He came for that person that's still sitting on the church pew, but their fire is almost gone out. He came for your daughters and your sons uh, who tell you, don't talk to me about church anymore, Mom. Don't talk to me. I don't believe in God the way you brought me up. He came for them. Their fire is just a smoke right now. But trust me, we've got to believe once again that Jesus came for the unlikely Christians. Amen. Praise God. Jesus is seeking those who are broken and bruised. And some of you can identify with that. Your heart is broken because of life circumstances. And you feel bruised on the inside of your heart and in your spirit. You feel bruised. And that you're barely hanging on. You, you've even thought about suicide. You've even thought about just giving up. Jesus came for the bruised reed and the smoking wick. Those of you who are just barely, everybody else would throw you away. Everybody else would get rid of you. Even some of your friends don't want anything to do with you. But Jesus wants you. Jesus came for you. And even though you're an unlikely Christian, he wants to make you a believer. Amen. The question has got to be asked today, what are we? 
the church looking for? We know now what Jesus is looking for, but what are we, the church, looking for? We fear who and what we don't know. Brother Dan, put that screen back up with the title today. When I when I put together this graphic for the for the sermon today, my wife said, you know, she was jokingly saying, I'm offended because that picture that I got off the internet looks like Jesus smoking a cigarette. Looks like Jesus in a hoodie. Maybe he's vaping. And I got to look at that. And I thought to myself, that's exactly who Jesus came for. He didn't come for people who were all cleaned up and churchified and they know when to say amen and they, they look the perfect role model. He didn't come for that. He came for the lost. He came for the person that we say, oh, it's unlikely that they'll be a Christian. We fear who and what we don't know and we're apprehensive about what we've heard about. You know, you see a guy that's riding a motorcycle and he's got leather on and tattoos and, and you know, he doesn't look like he just showered. And you think to yourself, oh, they wouldn't love the Lord. But listen, there's people that come to this church that ride Harleys and they got leather from head to toe, but they love Jesus with all their heart. Don't, don't worry about what you've been told. You need to think about the heart and the soul that is in that person that doesn't look like a likely Christian. But we've got to think past that like Jesus did. Jesus ate with the sinners, the prostitutes, the alcoholics. He loved them. He preached love to them. And he showed them that they weren't everything they'd been told. Right. Right. Ananias was honest with the Lord about Saul. He said, Lord, I've heard many things about this man. How much evil he's done to your saints. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Isn't it interesting that the church had the authority to throw people in jail? The Jews had become so powerful, they had their own policemen. They had their own ability to get you thrown in jail. We're talking about God's church here. But the truth of the matter is, is God's church today has a problem with throwing people in jail that really ought to be saved. We put them in the jail in our mind. We lock them out of the church. We say they're unlikely to be a Christian, but God can save anybody yes, who has a heart to receive him and believe in him and repent of their sins. Amen. What did the Lord tell Ananias about Saul? That, that man who stood there and held the coat and laughed as they stoned Stephen to death. What did the Lord say about Saul? He said, Ananias, he's a chosen instrument to carry my name. There's people in this room right now, you think I could never be part of the church because you don't know what I've done, preacher. I could never give my life to Jesus. He would never forgive me. You don't know what I thought. You don't know what I've said. You don't know what I've pumped into my arms. You don't know how ugly I've been. You don't know how much I curse. You don't know how, you don't know. But God knows. Yeah. Right. God knows. Right. And God has a design and a purpose for your life. Yeah. Just like he did Saul. Saul was the most unlikely person. If we would think of it like today, Saul would have been that African-American throwing rocks at the police and burning things down and breaking store windows. Oh, they can't be saved. Yes, they can. Amen. Yeah. Sure can. You drive into Indianapolis, certain parts of the town, you see people carrying weapons and acting ugly and cursing every other word and making rude gestures with their hands. They can't be saved. Yes, they can. Right. Yes, they can. Yeah. Hallelujah. How many do we write off as one who wouldn't want to be saved because of what we've heard about those people? 
We see people waving a rainbow flag. Those people can't be saved. Yes, they can. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, they can. Amen. Jesus did not come looking for religious, cleaned up, indoctrinated people. He came for the bruised, the broken, the sick, and for those who were once on fire, but barely are smoldering now. Do not. Church of the living God, listen, we're in the end times. We're, we're at the time where the Lord can sound the trumpet at any moment, and we all feel it, and we all know it. Amen. Amen. Don't let the devil convince you that they aren't worth praying for and not worth caring for. Somebody might have told you that that person would never accept the Lord. But I've seen too many people walk into a house of God full of, full of sin, full of corruption, and... and it, Something got a hold of their hearts. Something convicted them where we couldn't see. And it wasn't long till they were at the altar repenting of their sins. And the next thing you know, they're being baptized in Jesus' name. God can save anybody. Yes. Praise God. Amen. God has a purpose for those unlikely Christians. Get somebody in your mind right now that you think they couldn't be saved. Get somebody that you just think in your mind, I don't, I don't know, that'd be a tough one. Maybe the movie star who mocks Christians. I'll tell you a little secret about myself. In my prayer life for many, many years, I've prayed for Hollywood's biggest actors and for the pop stars that sing horrible songs because I believe they have a right to be saved. The Justin Bieber, the Kanye West, the, the Tory Kelly, who have all took huge career-ending stands to profess faith in Jesus Christ. There was a time where I thought to myself, Justin Bieber, he don't want anything to do with Jesus. I just heard his testimony the other day where he said, I reached a point where I had it all. I had millions of dollars. I could do whatever I wanted, but I was empty. Pray for the unlikely Christians that mock Christians just like Saul did. Pray for the young, angry teenagers that you see roaming the streets of Elwood. Some of us were unlikely Christians before we hit rock bottom. First right. Corinthians 6, verse 9 through 11, and I'm almost done. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkard, nor the revilers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Very true statement, but we don't stop there. Because in verse 11 it says, And such were some of you. Right. But you were washed. Right. Oh, I tell you, that, that excites me because some of us were, we were just good sinners. Now, I grew up in a pastor's home. You know, I have a certain set of circumstances that maybe you didn't have. But I was sharing with a person just the other day. I said, you can reach people that there's no way I can reach. That tattoo on your arm says something to the other person who's got a tattoo on their arm. I'm tattooed free, folks. I, I don't have cute enough legs or arms to put an ink on <laughs> It's just not something I want. But if you've got that, if that's part of who you are, listen, you can reach people that I can't reach. And you can walk into circumstances that I can't walk into. And you can reach the person. And, and many of you have a testimony that I don't know about yet. But you have some things in your life that you can say, I've been where you are, and I can tell you, Jesus will make a difference. He will change you radically, and he will give you hope like you never have. Jesus wants to save you. Amen. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified. That means you were set apart for a certain purpose. You were justified. How? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. And by the Spirit of our God. 
You know, the only thing that makes me different from the sinner that walks down the street that doesn't know God, that doesn't care about God, the only thing that makes a difference is the name of the Lord has been applied to my life and I have His Spirit in me. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And I'm very grateful for that. That's right. God has a purpose for us. And God has a purpose for those who have not yet repented. Before Saul ever was filled with the Spirit and baptized, before Saul ever accepted Jesus as the Messiah, God had already put his finger on him and said, I want that one. Just like God did for you one day. Amen. You see, the Bible tells us that his name was Saul of Tarsus, but when Jesus got a hold of him, his name was changed to Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ. There are still those who long for a name change before the great tribulation comes. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the earth will be shaken. Do you understand, folks, that everything Jesus said would happen has happened? But there are things coming that this world's not ready for. Revelation tells us of those things which will happen to those who miss the rapture. Those unlikely Christians that you will pray for and will witness to. They deserve a right to miss all of this. The Bible says that grievous sores will be upon those who take the mark of the beast. Sores so painful that they will gnaw on their own tongue. The seas and all the water supplies will become blood. And all aquatic life will die. That's what it says in the book of Revelation. The sun will have the ability to scorch human, humans with its heat. I don't believe in global warming, but what if it gets to the point where you can't even go outside without the sun, the sun burning your skin in a horrendous way? The Bible says that will happen. The Bible says the kingdom of the beast or the antichrist, that kingdom that he sets up will be so dark that people will know they will gnaw on their own tongue because of the pain. I believe there will be such mental anguish in the time of the tribulation that people will stay in their homes worried and full of fear. The Bible says the Euphrates River will dry up creating a pathway for armies to come. And fight in Armageddon. I'm not making this up. This comes directly out of Revelation. That's right. yep. The beast and the false prophet will speak under the influence of three unclean spirits. These are the spirits of devils working miracles and speaking to the world leaders to fight each other at Armageddon. Jesus said in Revelation 16, 15, Behold, I come as a thief. When Jesus Christ comes, nobody will be ready for it. No man knows the day or the hour. We don't know when the trumpet's going to sound. And there are so many people out there that have yet to be saved. There are your sons and your daughters, your friends, your neighbors that we pass by every single day. And we think they're an unlikely Christian, so why waste my time? But I'm telling you, Jesus wants to save them. And if there's anybody in this room today that you feel like you're a lost cause and nobody cares about you and nobody really, and God didn't care about you because if he did, I wouldn't be in the mess I'm in. But I'm telling you, there's a, there's a Savior in this room today that loves you, died for you, and wants you. If nobody else wants you, he wants you. So it's time for us to, to understand there are no unlikely or unexpected Christians. If a person is willing to listen, I'm willing to tell them. If a person is willing to repent of their sins, I'm going to keep cheering them on and leading them into greater, higher, higher heights and deeper depths in the Lord. You say, preacher, I don't have it all figured out. You don't have to. The Lord will show you. He will give you what you need. But I believe there are people watching today, even on Facebook, 
And I know, I feel it in my heart. There are people that are saying, maybe it is time that I start thinking about Jesus. Look at what this world is going through. Is it going to get better? Absolutely not. Because Jesus said in the last days, it would become more and more violent and more and more chaotic. And we've got to be ready to tell anybody we know about Jesus. Let's stand this morning. Praise God. If I would have met Lisa Fanning 10, 15 years ago, I would have thought, nah, she don't want to come to church. There are people in this room, if I would have met you when you were in the middle of your addiction, I would have prayed for you, been nice to you, but I would have thought, well, and you know what? The Lord has had to work on my heart. I have two boys that are not saved. They wandered away from the Lord. I pray for them every day. And sometimes they say, say things that I don't want them to say. I see the hardness in their heart, but I cannot quit praying for them. That's right. I cannot quit loving them back to Jesus. That's right. Because there's a hell that I don't want them to go to. And there's a heaven we all want to go to. Amen. I'm going to close today by praying with you all, but I want those who would come this morning. We're doing this just a little bit differently. But anybody who needs salvation, anybody who needs restoration, you need healing, or you need a blessing, I want you to come. I want to pray with you. God cares about you. Let's all bow our heads for prayer. You, Father, I pray that you would convict the heart of every person in this room. Lord, if we become callous and uncaring about the lost, wake us up. Lord, if there are people in this room that are saying, I'd love to go to the altar, but I'm scared. Lord, help them to be able to come and find salvation. Lord, we pray today that you would touch every person that's just barely hanging on, that you would revive them and restore them. And oh God, we ask you, Lord, to fill us once again with your spirit to overflowing. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. Come today, let's find us a place of prayer. Let's all come into the altar. I'd love to pray with you today. Whatever you need the Lord to do.